floor of one. Here we'll be talking about 7.4, which is a section on integration of rational functions by partial fractions. And we'll first start by talking what talking about what a partial fractions actually is. Um, otherwise, it's known as partial fraction decomposition. And basically, it's the process of getting any rational function and breaking it up into a sum of other rational functions whose denominators have smaller degrees, basically. So here's kind of the main idea is we want to reverse this process of combining two rational functions into one rational function. Notice, here we have x plus 1 and x plus 2 as the denominator, and the resulting rational function's denominator actually factors as the product of those denominators. So we want to, again, we want to uh, figure out this process in reverse. Namely, we want to find a and b such that our resulting expression here is equal to a over x plus 1 plus b over x plus 2. So we're going to uh, split this up in some sense as far as we're going to write this fraction as something over one of the factors plus something over the other. Now, in particular, that's only one particular instance. There's one case. In fact, there are four cases here, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these. So here are the setups. Before we even begin the setups, uh, we first require that the degree of the numerator must be uh, smaller than the degree of the denominator. Otherwise, we can use polynomial division. And we'll see a problem involving that. But um, now here we have these four cases. The first case is where we have what are called distinct linear factors. And I'm writing them as x plus a, x plus b, but they could be like 3x plus 2, for instance. So there could be numbers in front of x, but I'm just not writing that. And the setup is just a over one of the factors plus b over the other one plus c over the next one and so on, depending on how many factors you have in the bottom. Again, so long as they're linear factors. Case two is where you have, so here distinct means they're different. So it can't be x plus one and x plus one in case one. For case two, it can be because we have what are called repeated linear factors. So for instance, if the x plus a is repeated three times, you do the setup kind of normally, only for the one that's repeated, you need a over that repeated factor plus b over that repeated factor to one less power and then keep decreasing the power until you get to the first power, basically. So you need one for the highest power of, um, of that factor present, and then all powers um, in between, basically. So all powers starting with the first power all the way up to the highest power that is repeated. In this case, I give an example of three, but it could be five, in which case you need to the fifth, to the fourth, to the third, then to the second, and then finally to the one. But notice the numerators are just a, b, c, and d. Good. because again, the factors are linear. Here for case three, the uh, factors are quadratic, so we have it, what is called an irreducible quadratic factor. And if you have an irreducible quadratic factor, that, by the way, is just a quadratic factor that cannot be factored. And a good example of that is x squared plus a number. x squared plus a positive number can never be factored. Think of x squared plus one. x squared plus one can't be factored. That's a good example. Now, the setup here kind of reminds us of case one, only for the terms containing quadratic factors as their denominators, the numerator must be linear, hence the ax plus b over this quadratic factor, and then we continue plus c over it again. You get the idea. So again, uh, the kind of scheme behind naming these coefficients on top are just capital letters from a, b, c, and so on, basically as far as you need to go. So now with the fourth case here, we have repeated quadratic factors. So here I've uh, basically combined case one and case two, where we have this irreducible quadratic factor, but now to the third power, and it's kind of what you'd expect it to be. You need one for that power and for each power below that, and the numerators will be linear. Notice ax plus b, cx plus d, and ex plus f. Of course, again, because their denominators are quadratic, not linear. Good. So now we're going to see a few examples of actually uh, setting this up and then even solving for a, b, and c, and d. And just to make things go a little more quickly, uh, we're actually going to see why we need this and why this is important as far as integrating goes. Right, so we're going to start off with solving this integral here. This notice is a definite integral. Our denominator, we want to factor first so we can consider a setup. But notice the degree at the top is actually equal to the degree at the bottom and we don't want that. In fact, if the degree at the top is bigger than or even equal to the degree at the bottom, we have to use some type of polynomial division to split it up. So I'm actually going to use um, long division real quickly. 
I'm not going to talk about the process too much. It's something you probably should have seen before, but um, just kind of hear me out. So x squared times 3 will give me 3x squared. So if we multiply by 3 to each of these terms, we end up getting 3x squared plus, let's see, 3 times 3x is 9x, and then plus, well, 3 times 2 is 6. And I want to subtract these to find the remainder. And notice these first two will cancel. 6x minus 9x is negative 3x. And then 2 minus uh, 6 will be um, negative 4. So that's this is actually our remainder. In other words, we can write this uh, rational function as the quotient 3 plus the remainder, uh, which is negative 3x minus 4, over the original denominator. And I'm going to notice a few things. I'm going to notice first off that 3x minus 4, they both have the negative in common, so I'm going to pull the negative out just to make things look a little nicer. At the same time, I'm going to notice that we can actually factor this denominator as uh, x plus 1 times x plus 2. Great. And our limits haven't changed. And now what's really nice is that we can actually take the antiderivative of this and take care of that part already if you want. Um, I think maybe we'll do that. It's kind of hard to tell if we should do it right away or not. Um, you know, I'm just going to leave it like that for right now. But here I definitely want to consider this integral. So um, I don't know why I always sound so indecisive. I am going to do it. So the antiderivative of 3, notice, is just 3x. And then evaluating 3x in between 1 and 2 is going to be 6 minus 3, which is just 3 itself. So, in fact, this first integral will give you 3, but then we have minus this integral. So altogether, what we end up getting is 3, which again is the result of this integral part, minus the integral from 1 to 2 of what we have left over, which is this guy. So now what we want to do is we want to try to split this up using the uh, setup we saw previously for partial fraction decomposition that is applicable here. This is a 4. Great. And the one that's applicable, of course, is to write this as a over this plus b over this. So it's going to be 3 minus the integral from 1 to 2 of a over x plus 1 plus b over x plus 2. And again, the reason there is because they are distinct linear factors. x plus 1 and x plus 2 are both linear and they're different. So now, how can we find A and B? Well, let's see. So to find A and B, what we're going to do, there's a, there's a few ways of doing it. I'll try to show you both ways here. I don't want to take too much time in explaining it, but at least we can see it, hopefully. So one way is what is called equating coefficients. And to equate coefficients, basically you have to um, combine these back into one fraction. And in doing that, basically you get A times Notice it will be a times the opposite denominator, x plus 2, plus b times the opposite denominator, x plus 1. And that's going to be all divided by the original denominator, which is just x plus 1 times x plus 2. So in other words, combining these two together, we end up getting this expression. And notice this is equal to this. We're trying to rewrite this fraction as the sum of these two. So this is straight up equal to this. And since we already know the denominators are the same, we don't even need the denominators. So we can just forget about the, de de the uh, denominators altogether, and we end up getting, um, well, let me just erase that for a moment. And we end up getting this equation here, um, a times x plus 2 plus b times x plus 1 equals 3x plus 4. So that's setting the numerators equal together once we have combined these two back into one. And now I'm going to rewrite that um, equating coefficients. And you'll see why I erase it in a moment. So I'm going to distribute this. So if you combine things, you get ax plus 2a, bx plus b. And notice the things that have x are a and b. So we can actually rewrite that as a plus b times x plus 2a plus, um, plus b. Now why am I writing it funny like this? Because I want to compare to the coefficients of this polynomial that it's equal to, 3x plus 4. Namely, I want to compare the coefficients, equating the coefficients. So set a plus b equal to 3, set 
a uh, 2a plus b equal to 4. Solve that system of equations, and then we'll find a and b. That's one way of doing it. We can certainly proceed in that manner. And notice that this uh, system of equations is actually not too bad to solve. In fact, if you just multiply the top by negative and add straight down, these cancel. We get 2a minus a is just a, and 4 minus 3 is 1, so a is 1. Plugging back into uh, a plus b equals 3. If a is 1, b must be 2 in order for them to add to 3. So along with this, we get b is equal to 2. So we're done. So now we successfully uh, found out that these are 1 and 2. But again, I want to show you a kind of different method. So this method is doable, and sometimes it's necessary, but for the most part, there's a quicker method, which is known as Heaviside's method. And Heaviside's method basically says, we already have an equation here, so we don't actually have to distribute. And we can look at this equation of the numerators, and we can set any value of x we want to this to get an equation involving a and b. So why not pick values of x that will make one of these factors go to 0? And notice these are just um, results that will make the denominator 0 because these factors are coming from the denominator. So notice one value that we can make, um, we can select to make one of these zero is x equals negative two. It'll make this zero. And then plug in a negative two to the rest of x. Uh, rest of the x's, we get negative two plus one, which is negative one. So this will end up being negative b only on the left is equal to, when you plug in negative two here, you end up getting, um, well, let's see, that's going to be negative six plus four. And you know what? Now that I think about it, something kind of funny happened. Uh, why did we not? So it doesn't coincide. No, it does coincide. I'm sorry. So we get negative, uh, negative 2 times 3 is negative 6 plus 4 is negative 2. Okay, that's fine. So divided by negative, we get b is equal to 2 indeed. Sorry for the pause for a moment. I just kind of got lost in the fact that I forgot this negative was there, but that's fine. So now we're going to let x be equal to what? Well, if x is negative 1, then this factor is 0. And it's setting x equal to negative 1 of everything. Negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1, so this will be a on the left. We don't need this b part because negative 1 plus 1 is 0, so that term is gone. And then plug in negative 1 to here. We'll just give you negative 3 plus 4, which is positive 1. So notice right away we end up getting something a little quicker. And Heaviside's method is basically meant for that. Now, depending on the setup scenario we had from those cases, um, Heaviside's method may be meaningless, kind of depending. And I'll try to be using this method more than this method, but every now and then, again, depending on the setup, we'll be seeing this method creep up every now and then. So I hope we understand this idea. We're going to get an equation by combining these back into one, looking at the numerator, setting that equal to the original numerator of our fraction that we split up, and then plugging in values of x to get nice equations, and hopefully solving for those. Okay, so now, we're going to plug a to b1, b to b2 back into this, and then solve this integral finally. All right, so we discovered that a was 1 and b was 2, so let's just uh, replace those with 1 and 2 respectively. And now we can find the antiderivative of each of these. Now, they kind of require their own uh, u substitution, to be quite honest. Let the denominator be u for each one. Uh, but notice, since the derivative of u in each case will just be 1, then really what we can do is we can just say that it's going to be ln of the denominator. So really this is 3 minus ln of x plus 1 plus 2 ln of x plus 2 and then evaluating this expression here in brackets, which we wanted to. Now again, how did I get this? I'll show you with the second one, just for reference. And you can kind of tell based on the work here that it'll be true indeed for the first one. And then I'll try to generalize this as well. So notice first we can pull the 2 out, hence the 2 in front, that's fine. And if we let u equal x plus 2, notice the du is just equal to dx. So for our substitution here, we just end up getting 1 over u du. The antiderivative of 1 over u, of course, is ln of u with absolute values. So I guess we need the absolute values here, but not really though, because when you um, consider the limits, we're going to get positive values anyways but might as well just write them for good measure. 
And yeah, I would write plus C, but again, we don't really need it for these problems because they're definite integrals. And then notice that since uh, U is X plus two, we finally get this and great. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll generalize this later, but first let's finish the problem now. So now we're gonna plug in two, then plug in one, subtract those results, and then distribute the negative and add that to three, combine and hopefully get a nice looking answer. Let's see what we get. So if we plug in two, this term is element of three, so it's three minus, we got element of three, plus two times ln of, when you plug in two here, you get ln four, that's the first evaluation, minus when you plug in one, you get ln of two, because one plus one is two, of course, plus two times ln of, well, three, because uh, one plus two is three. Close brackets, great. So now we'll distribute and hopefully combine some things. Um, Let's see what happens. So we get three minus the quantity ln three plus two ln four minus ln two minus two ln three. These kind of combine to negative one ln three, so just negative ln of three. Um, yeah, there's a little bit we can actually do here. Let's, uh, let's distribute the negative, I guess. Well, let's first combine these. So let's see, ln of three minus two ln of three is negative ln of three. And if we distribute the negative, that becomes positive ln of three. That becomes negative two ln of four. And this becomes positive ln of two. Now, I kind of want to leave it like this. There's actually a little more we can do here, though. Notice there are some natural log properties. In fact, just logarithmic properties in general that I want to apply. And in fact, there are some really nice ones we can apply. The first one I want to apply is the following ln of x to the r is equal to r times ln of x. And this is not only true for ln, it's true for any log, log base any number. So recall that ln is actually log base e, so it's a logarithm in its own right, so this property applies to that. There are a few other properties we'll be applying, but I'll kind of mention them as we go along. So first, uh, let's apply this here. So notice, where do we have a power? We have a power here with four. Notice four is two to the two. So we can pull the power out. So pulling this two out, two times two is four. So we have this. Great. And of course the benefit of writing it like that is so we can now combine these because now they're like terms. And notice negative four plus one is negative three. So we'll get three plus ln of three minus three ln of two. And now, although it may not be super necessary, there is actually a way you can combine a little further I'm going to box it like this because I think it's pretty acceptable, but I do want to show you the way we can actually simplify a little further. We can bring the power back in. And in fact, if you bring the power in as a negative, then it'll be ln of uh, two to the negative three, which is one over eight. But there's another property I want to use, ln of x plus ln of y, so ln of x plus ln of y is equal to ln of x times y, like that. So. And in fact, when you have subtraction, it's division, because again, when you bring the negative power in, you end up getting a reciprocal. So another way we can write our answer here is 3 plus ln of 3, and since it's minus 2 to the third, because if you bring this in, you get 2 to the third, that's uh, going to be ln 3 minus ln of 8, so that's ln of 3 over 8. And yeah, we kind of don't really need the parentheses, but I'm just writing there, writing them there. Um, so I hope that was okay. But again, the three comes in as a power, so we get two to the three, that's eight. Ln of three minus ln of eight is ln of three over eight. So that's kind of using, so this is the power rule for ln, or for logs. This is the product rule for logs, and then we're missing the quotient rule, which is ln of x minus ln of y is equal to ln of x over y. So now we'll move on and see a few more examples. Right, so as previously mentioned, I wanted to show some generalizations, so I'm calling them facts here. So the first fact is that if we have basically the, enter, the integral of one over a linear function ax plus b, we can always integrate this basically by using u substitution as I kind of previously mentioned, and we'll end up getting one over a times ln of absolute value of that denominator ax plus b plus c. Now where the one over a comes from is the derivative of our u substitution. 
So if you let u be equal to ax plus b, du will be a dx. And then that means that 1 over a du will be equal to dx, and then if you continue with the u substitution, you'll get this. The next thing is this guy here. And this we can actually show uh, by means of trig substitution. If you let x be equal to a tangent, then this actually solves quite nicely. I kind of want to show you honestly, but it's a 7.3 problem. So let x equal a tangent and try to integrate based on that and you'll get this. It just kind of falls out. It's really, really nice. It looks complicated, but it's actually not that bad. So now I'm going to continue with this and hopefully we see both of these facts utilized here. Notice this is a case three problem where we have a um, linear factor and of course here we have a quadratic. It's irreducible. I said earlier that x squared plus a number is always going to be a irreducible quadratic. Notice x squared minus nine actually factors as difference of squares, but x squared plus nine does not factor. Um, the reason why it doesn't factor is because its zeros are complex basically, but you can kind of think about it more if you'd like on your own. Um, the good news here uh, really is that it, the denominator is already factored for us, so we can just move right into the setup. So it's going to be, well, a over one of the factors, and I would write plus b over the other factor, but since our other factor is quadratic, its numerator isn't just b, but it's bx plus c. Great. So now I'm going to combine these to find our equation and use the heavy sides method we uh, spoke about earlier. So notice multiplying this top and bottom by x squared plus 9 and this top and bottom by x minus 1 gives the following numerator. Just like that. And this is the numerator of that expression only. And the numerator of this must be equal to the numerator of the original thing we're splitting up, which is just 10. And that's nice because by Heaviside's method, which I'll just denote by HM, uh, Heaviside, by the way, is the name of the last name of the mathematician that, um, well, I don't know if he discovered this method, but he's, his, um, the method's named after him anyways. So let's see. Uh, we want to pick a value for x that we like. I like 1 because that'll make this go to 0. So if x is equal to 1, what do we end up getting? we end up getting, well, let's see. This is going to be 1 squared plus 9, that's 10, so we get 10a. That goes to 0 because it's going to be b plus c, but then times 0. So 10a is equal to 10 divided by 10. Right away, we get a is equal to 1. Beautiful. There's an issue, though, and the issue is that we no longer have a value that we can plug in to make the other factor 0. Um, why is that? Well, it's basically because x squared plus 9 can't be factored, meaning that it has no real zeros or at least no rational zeros. So let's see if we can uh, pick another nice value that we know. I like zero, so let's plug in zero directly. When you plug in zero, you get 9a here. Plus, when you plug in zero here, you get just zero plus c, so that's just c, times zero minus one, that's negative one. Negative one times c makes this negative c. That's equal to 10. So that's pretty good. It's actually really good because we know what a is. a is one. So since a is 1, this really says 9 minus c is equal to 10. So actually, if we um, add c and subtract 10, we get that c is equal to 9 minus 10, which is negative 1. Fantastic. One more value to find, and that's b. And honestly, we can pick any x value we want. Um, let's plug in 2. We could plug in negative 1, but I don't want to deal with double, double negatives. Let's just plug in 2. So when you plug in 2, we're going to get 2 squared here. 2 squared is 4, plus 9 is 13. Since a is 1, that's 1 times 13. Okay. Plus, when you plug in 2 here, you get 2b plus c. So that's 2b plus c, c is negative 1, times 2 minus 1 is 1. So in fact, we just get this alone. That's equal to 10. Notice these combine to 12. So we really have 12 plus 2b is equal to 10. Subtract 12. Oh, that's nice. Look at that. So we get 2b is equal to negative 2. Dividing by 2 gives us that b is negative 1. Let me just kind of stand back for a moment and check my work to make sure we're okay. Sounds great because the numbers are clean. 
but you never know. So it's a uh, good, um, it's good practice to just kind of take some time to reflect on your work. All right, so I reflected. So now that I can see that A is one, C is negative one, and B is negative one, we'll plug those in. So I'm gonna do that right now. So I'm gonna replace A with one. I'm gonna replace B with negative one and C with negative one. But notice we can actually just factor out the negative here and call this X plus one. One times X plus one, which is just X plus one. So I hope we're okay with that. And now what? Um, this honestly is a little tricky. Anytime you have a linear over a quadratic type of rational, um, yeah, type of rational uh, function, it's a little tricky sometimes, but the, the good news is that when the denominator is in particular of the form x squared plus a number, splitting it up always works. Um, otherwise, you kind of have to try a few things, but yeah, that's fine. So I'm going to erase this and then we'll continue. Right, so as previously mentioned, we're going to split this up um, into separate integrals. So we got 1 over x minus 1 dx minus the integral of x over x squared plus 9 dx. And then minus, because again, negative, the integral of 1 over x squared plus 9 dx. Now, I kind of said this earlier just to kind of give you an idea that um, if you have your denominator as x squared plus 9, or x squared plus a number, then splitting it up is the way to go. You can always make that happen via completing the square. And we kind of saw this in 7.3 a little bit, and with a little u substitution after completing the square for any quadratic in your denominator, you can get this kind of form where it's a quadratic, and if the numerator is linear, you can just split it up as so. Which sounds complicated, and we're not going to be doing too many problems like that, but um, it's something that can definitely be done. So just kind of throwing that out there. Now, this is pretty simple using this fact. This is just ln of absolute value of x minus 1. Notice the coefficient of x is just 1, so there's nothing to divide by in front. Here, we need a u sum. So we're going to let u equal the denominator, x squared plus 9. So notice here, du would be equal to 2x dx, in which case, 1 half du will be equal to x dx. Perfect. Which is, of course, good because we have x dx in the numerator right here, just to kind of show you. Great. So now, applying the substitution, we get negative the integral of, well, let's see, uh, x dx is replaced with 1 half to u, so I can pull the 1 half out, and it's minus. And then the denominator becomes u, so this is 1 over u to u. And the antiderivative of 1 over u is ln of absolute value of u. So we get ln of absolute value of u, but u, of course, is x squared plus 9. So this is absolute val ln of absolute value of x squared plus 9 with a negative 1 half out in front for the middle term. And then minus, finally, notice that 9 is 3 squared, and we can apply this second fact for sure. It's 1 over x squared plus a squared. In this case, it's x squared plus 3 squared, and we're just going to use this as a fact. So here we're going to get for the... Um, third term, 1 over 3, tangent inverse of x over 3. So we have our three terms, this one, this one, and this one. Then we're just going to write plus c and call it a day. Well, call it a problem anyways, because we're going to do more examples. So I'm going to erase this and write that just to complete this. All right, perfect. So I've uh, gathered each of those three results we got, combine them together, write plus c, box it up, call it a day. Again, problem but not completely done with the video but um, I do want to go over something real quick notice this one half we can bring in as a power inside of this ln and something to the one half power is just to the square root of that and since we're doing minus ln of something minus ln of something else is ln of the quotient so if you want to simplify this a little further you can simplify it as ln of the absolute value of x minus 1 over radical x squared plus 9 minus one third tangent inverse of x over three plus c. Then we'll box it up and call that our solution. Awesome. Now this last part, honestly, mm, I don't really care for it too much. I, I think it's kind of cool that you can do that, but this is just as likely. It's just as nice. So just, uh, just to explain that 
These are both acceptable answers. I'll box both of them. But if you want to simplify a little further, you actually can, and there it is. So now we're gonna take a look at a few more examples still. Right, so for this example here, notice that we have a quadratic factor squared. But hold on, this quadratic factor is actually not irreducible, and uh, we can tell because it's something squared minus a number. So remember I said if you had, for example, the previous problem, if it was x squared minus nine, that's a difference of squares. Similarly, t squared minus one is a difference of squares, actually. So we can actually rewrite this as the integral of dt all divided by, if you actually factor this, it's t squared um, minus one is equal to t minus one times t plus one by difference of squares. Since it's all squared, we get um, a repeat of each of those basically. So we get t minus one squared times t plus one squared. And this is actually case two where we have a repeat of linear factors. So we can actually try to set this up. Uh, I don't have space up there, but that's okay. We can actually try to set this up as the integral of a over the first factor squared plus b over the first factor without the square. Remember, that's the setup for repeated factors. And then playing the same game now, but with t plus 1. So we got c over t plus 1 squared. Good. And then plus d, finally, over uh, t plus 1 without the square. All right. So again, what we're going to try to do is we're going to combine this into one fraction and then uh, find our Heaviside's method equation. And then finally, pick nice values of x to find out what a, b, and c, and even d are. Um, notice that if we multiply this top and bottom by t minus 1, we end up getting a matching of the squares. And if we multiply this top and bottom by t plus 1, we get a matching of those as well. So to get this common denominator, this only needs t, um, t plus 1 squared. So that's only going to be multiplied to t plus 1 squared. b, as we mentioned, needs 1t minus 1 to make the square for t minus 1, but then in, in addition, it also needs that t plus 1 squared. So we can see this is going to get kind of long. And then uh, plus c, what does c need? c needs t minus 1 squared to match this denominator here. So I hope we can see where I'm getting these values from. And then finally, plus d times, it needs 1t plus 1 to make t plus 1 squared on the bottom, but then it would need um, t minus 1 quantity squared to match that common denominator. So of course, if you combine these four, they would be all over this same common denominator. So that means that this numerator expression is equal to the original numerator, which again, I like doing this. So in view of the numerator is actually one. So this crazy thing is equal to one. Fantastic. So this is our equation we'll be using heavy sides on. So let's see if uh, we can make that happen. So what values of t do we like? Well. When the denominator is zero, really it's when t is equal to one from this factor and negative one from that one. So that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna pick t to be plus one and then negative one after the fact. So let's see what happens. When t is equal to one, anything that contains a t minus one goes to zero. Namely, that's zero, that's zero, that's zero. So all that's left is this. And notice when you plug in one, you get two. One plus one is two squared, so it's four. So we're gonna get four a is equal to that side only plug in t equals one it just stays one anyways so we end up getting that a is equal to one fourth actually okay what about when t is equal to negative one well the opposite happens now this goes to zero this also goes to zero because it has t plus one that doesn't that does so here what do we get we get uh, negative one minus one because again we're letting t be negative one negative one minus one is negative two negative two squared is also positive four so we get 4c in this case is equal to 1, and then divided by 4 gives us the c is equal to 1 fourth. Okay, great. So now we're kind of stuck because we don't have any more nice values to plug in that will give us zeros. And we still have some more unknowns. So we have a, we have c, and that's fine, but we still need to find b and d. So remember that we can just plug in any number we want and just fo follow the equation accordingly. So I'm going to plug in zero. That's always a nice value to plug in if you hadn't, um, haven't plugged it in already, that is. So notice when you uh, plug in zero, here we're just going to get one squared times a, so that's just a, which is one fourth, by the way, plus, uh, let's see, when b, when uh, this is zero, we get negative one, okay, and then uh, zero plus one is one, one squared is one, so here we're going to get negative b. 
So that's minus b. And then here when you plug in t to be 0, that's just going to be negative 1 squared, which is positive 1. So that's just c, which is also 1 fourth like a was. And then here when you plug in 0, you get positive 1 here, positive 1 here because it's negative 1 squared. So that's just plus d. So it's kind of interesting because unlike the previous example we saw, we actually can solve for one of them. Instead, we just get an equation involving both of them. But that's okay. We'll just kind of tidy it up a bit. I'm going to write this as um, negative b plus d. Notice uh, these two combine to one half. If you subtract one half to the other side, you get one half on the other side. So I'm going to call our kind of answer, quote unquote, negative b plus d is equal to one half. And again, the way I got that one half was combining these one fourths. One fourth plus one fourth is two fourths, which is one half subtracting it over here. One minus one half is one half. So we get this equation. And we're going to plug in another value of t to get another equation. Then we can solve the system of equations here, which remember is something we kind of saw when we used the equate coefficients method. We ended up getting systems of equations. Now, if you use that method directly here, you get a system of four variables with four equations. So it's a little yikes. Heaviside's method is a little cleaner, but you still may need to solve some uh, systems of equations sometimes. So what value of t do we like? Let's plug in two. So be a little careful, but let's see. Two plus one is three, three squared is nine. So it's nine times a, so that's nine over four. When you plug in two here, two minus one is one. 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 squared is 9, so that's going to be plus 9b. Plus, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, so that's plus c. And then plus, oh, um, yeah, it's plus c, but c is 1 fourth, so might as well fill that in. And then plus, let's see, 2 plus 1 is 3, so it's going to be 3d. And then uh, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, so it's going to be plus 3d, actually, equals 1. Now, these actually combine to 10 over 4, which reduces to 5 over 2. And if you subtract 5 over 2 to this side, you get the following. So let's see. We get 9b plus 3d is equal to... What's 1 minus 5 over 2? Well, 5 over 2 is 2.5, 2 and a half. Um, 2 and a half minus 1 is uh, 1 and a half. So 1 minus 2 and a half is negative 1 and a half which is the fraction is negative 3 over 2. And I was kind of expecting that because look, notice here we have 3, and here we also have this, the numerator is a multiple of 3. So if you divide 3 by 3, you actually end up getting the following. You end up getting 3b plus d is equal to negative 1 half. So let me just write here, divide by 3 in parentheses, just so you kind of understand what we did. So we simplified things as well as divided 3 by 3. And notice that we have the system of these two equations, so maybe let me not circle this now. And if we combine these by subtracting, I want to do, let's say, um, I guess we can do, well, I'm going to negate the top one. So if you negate the top one, I'll, I'll change all the signs, positive here, negative here, that becomes negative. And then if you actually down the d's cancel, so you end up getting 4b is equal to, let's see, Negative 1 half minus 1 half is negative 1. So then dividing by 4 gives me that b is equal to negative 1 fourth. Perfect. But then what's d? Well, notice here we have uh, b minus d is negative 1 half. So let's see if we can solve that. Since b is negative 1 fourth, we have negative 1 fourth minus d is equal to negative 1 half. So then adding 1 fourth to the other side. Um, in fact, maybe it's better to swap these. Yeah, so if we add d to this side and add 1 half to that side, we get negative 1 fourth plus 1 half is equal to d. That I think is okay. And uh, notice uh, 1 half minus 1 fourth is just 1 fourth. So really we get d is equal to 1 fourth. There's a lot of 1 fourths here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to replace a, b, c, and d with our setup with what we found them to be with this crazy method here. So a is 1 fourth. B is 1 4, um, B is negative 1 4 actually, so let me write like this, minus 1 4. C is 1 4, and D is 1 4. Weird. 
why is this the only negative? I don't know, it's kind of bizarre. Now, if you want, you can verify this on your own by actually combining them. And um, you'll see that indeed you, the, the numerator will be some weird expression where it turns them and canceling out, and then it ends up being one. So these are the magical numbers that make that work. All right, so of course, these are just constants. So I'm going to pull them out of the integral, split this up, and then handle each of them individually. And I think we can, let me see if we're okay to go from there. Um, yeah, I think we'll be fine. So let me clean this up and we'll do that right now. Right, so I split it up, pulled out the one fourths in each one, and uh, notice that these two will be relatively easy using that fact we saw involving ln. So I'm just gonna write it right now. This is gonna be negative one fourth ln of absolute value of t minus one. This is gonna be one fourth times ln of absolute value of t plus one. And in fact, you know what? They all have one fourth in common. I kind of just want to pull that out at the very beginning, but the way I've split it up is okay. We'll pull one fourth out at the very end to maybe simplify things. Uh, but let me say for the ones that have a square denominator, it may look a little weird at first, but all it really is, is just a u substitution. So notice this is really the same as the integral of t minus one to the negative two. Similarly, that one is uh, t plus one to the negative two. So if we let u equal t minus 1, notice in that case du is just equal to dt. So not really much happens there. And then using that u substitution, we end up getting the integral of u to the negative 2 du. And we can apply power rule here. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So if you add 1 to the power, you get u to the negative 1, and then divide it by negative 1. But notice dividing by negative 1 just makes it negative, really. So we get that. And notice this is the same as negative 1 over u, but since u is equal to t minus 1, we get negative 1 over t minus 1. And nothing really is special about t minus 1. This is true for any linear expression, so long as the, um, the linear coefficient is 1. Otherwise, you'll get a different um, multiplier here to the differential. So in that, in that case, uh, this will actually be a very similar result. So the integral of this is negative one over t, so we write as a, as a negative one fourth times one over t minus one, like that. This will also be negative one over four times one over the denominator without the square. Great. So can we combine these in any significant way? Mm, maybe. I'm gonna pull one fourth out. Now, to be quite honest again, you can just add these together, right plus c, and, and call it a day for this problem. But I would like to show you simplification stuff when we can. We have a little bit of time, so I'll, I'll show that. So again, notice they all have one fourth in common, so we can just kind of pull that out. Now the one over one minus t, and the, um, let me just think for a second, this is negative, isn't it? Hmm. In fact, they're all negative except for this one, so if you pull out negative, then they all become positive, the last one becomes negative. So let's just do it like that, I guess. So if we consider one over t minus one and a now positive one over t plus one, we can actually combine these over, their product will be t squared minus one. So when you actually multiply this top and bottom by t plus one, you just obviously get t plus one. And here, if you multiply top and bottom by t minus one, you get plus t minus one. And the really nice thing here is that these cancel out and you just get 2t over that. So this is 2t over t squared minus 1. Nice. Okay, so that's combining those uh, non-ln parts. So I hope that was, that was okay. It's not too bad. And then the ln ones, again, we're pulling out the negative. So now this is positive and that's negative. So we're really doing ln of this one minus ln of this one. And we saw earlier that ln of something minus ln of something else is ln of the quotient first over second. So this is going to be plus ln of t minus 1 over t plus 1. Great. So I think this is actually a pretty nice looking simplification. So all we really need now again is our plus c. We can box it up and be done with this problem. And now on to the next example. Right, so this one I think is gonna be nice. Notice the numerator is indeed a smaller degree than the denominator. 
if you expand it out, x squared plus 1 times x squared plus 1 actually has x to the fourth as its highest power. So we don't need to do any tricky um, long division or anything like that. We can actually just jump right into the setup here if we recall what the setup is. So we have a repeated factor, but our, um, our factor is a irreducible quadratic actually. So we need something over x squared plus one to the second, and then another one for just x squared plus one with alpha power, and then dx. Now again, since they're quadratic factors, the numerators must be ax plus b, and then uh, cx plus d. Now what we have to do really is just find out what a, b, and c, and d are, and then we can use integration techniques. So let's combine these. Uh, notice we all we really need to do actually is multiply top and bottom of this one by x squared plus one to get a common denominator. So we end up getting a, ax plus b plus cx plus d multiplied to the quantity x squared plus one, just like that. And that'll give the same common denominator, and that'll be equal to the original numerator, x squared plus x plus 1. Always equal to the original numerator. Of course, there's no nice values here at all, because the only denominator factor we had was x squared plus 1, which has no nice zeros. If you want, you actually could, I know some people are probably thinking, if you want, you could actually plug in i negative i, see what happens. It's not terrible, but it's kind of, it's a little weird. I'm going to plug in zero. So when you plug in zero, let's see what we get. Notice we're trying to find four variables, A, B, C, and D. So we need to plug in at least four things. So let's see. When X is zero, we just get B here. Here we just get a D, so plus D. And that's actually it, because notice this is a zero plus one, so it's times one. It doesn't do anything for that. And then when you plug in zero, there you go one. Great, so we get an equation. That's fine, let's just kind of circle it so that we know we're gonna use that maybe, and then let's uh, proceed. So now let's plug in one, let's say. Oh, when you plug in one, fun stuff happens. So we get ax plus b is just gonna be a plus b. That's just gonna be c plus d. But notice uh, this is gonna be one squared plus one is two. If you distribute the two, you get uh, two c plus 2d equals, when you plug in 1 here, all the x's are 1, so you just get equals 3. Oh, man. So it's not looking good. But again, let's just keep going. So let's plug in a uh, negative 1, maybe. Maybe we can force a nice scenario. So here we get negative a plus b. I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. We get negative c plus d. Uh, here, negative 1 squared plus 1 is 2, so distributing the 2 gives us um, negative 2c plus 2d. And when we, when we plug a negative 1 to the right, negative 1 squared is positive 1, but then uh, minus 1 cancels and we just get 1 left over. And this is kind of good because if you combine these, you actually get another equation involving b and d. Um, do we get anything nice? We, we get something new, actually, if you combine those. Um, so should I do that right here? Might as well. So I'm noticing that pattern, so I'm going to do that right here and see what happens. So when we combine these, I'm going to not, I'm going to try not to um, write over them. But when you combine them, notice the A's cancel, the two C's cancel. So we get 2B plus 4D is equal to 4. And if you divide through by 2, you just get B plus 2D is equal to 2. So we can actually combine these two. So we have b plus d equals 1, and b plus 2d equals 2. So if we subtract like this, notice the b's cancel. Here we get d minus 2d, which is negative d, equals 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. That means d is actually positive 1. Perfect. And that actually means b is 0. See that? See why it means b is 0? because 1 plus 1 is equal to 1, 0 plus 1. Fantastic. So now, this gives us some, um, some interesting ideas here, but they're not the greatest, I don't think. We're going to try our best to incorporate these now new values for D and B into um, these equations here, but chances are they'll be the same, unfortunately. I have a hunch that's the case anyways, but let's see. 
Notice when B is 0, these are gone. When D is 1, these are just 2. So actually they don't look the same. No, they are the same. Because if you subtract 2 to this side, you get that this is equal to 1. And if you subtract 2 to this side, you get this is equal to negative 1. Just like that. And notice the bottom equation is just negative the top equation. So that's a little unfortunate, but at least we have one of them. So let me kind of combine them a little more closely. I know I'm erasing a lot as I go along, so you may have to like um, fast forward the video. Well, not fast forward, but rewind as needed. And I guess fast forward as needed. So negative one doesn't really spit out too much, unfortunately. We just get a retelling of x equals one. So what about when x is equal to two? Maybe we get something new. And we have values here for b and d. So I think we're making really good progress. So when x is equal to 2, we get 2a plus b, which is 0, plus that's going to be 2c plus d, which is 1, times, uh, let's see, that's going to be 2 squared, which is 4, plus 1 is 5. So let's distribute the 5, we'll get 10c plus 5. And then equals, when you plug in 2 here, 2 squared is 4, plus 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7. And if you subtract that to this side, we end up getting um, 2a plus 10c is equal to 2. And then dividing through by 2 gives us that a plus 5c is equal to 1. Fantastic. So now we finally have a new equation. We can combine these somehow. In fact, we'll just subtract. And maybe you can tell if you just... I'll just write it just for good measure, I guess. You know what? I'll go ahead and negate the bottom equation. So if you negate the bottom equation, you notice you get the a and negative a. These cancel. We end up with negative 3c is equal to 0. That's interesting. So that means c is 0. Okay. So that means a has to be 1 then from the top equation. So notice when c is 0, we'll have 1 plus 0 is equal to 1. a plus 0 is equal to 1, so a is 1. That's a little weird. Okay, so let's see if we can erase some things and plug these values in. I'll just do it right now. b is 0, so this is really just 1x plus 0, which is just x alone. That's nice. Here, c is 0, so there's no x term actually in the numerator. And d is negative 1. No, d is positive 1. Wow, pretty crazy. So now, um, well, now I'm going to erase this and let's see if we can continue with some te techniques of integration. Um, I can actually see it right away. The first one will require a u substitution. When the denominator is equal to u, du will be 2x. So let me just kind of take care of that real quick. So if u is equal to x squared plus 1, then du is going to be 2x dx. So we've seen this a bunch of times already, for u substitution anyways. So that means we're going to, if we split this integral up, um, x dx is replaced with 1 half du. So it's 1 half integral of du. But then we get what? We get 1 over u squared. And we know 1 over u squared is u to the negative 2. And we know the antiderivative of u to the negative 2 is u to the negative 1 over negative 1. So really this is negative 1 half. 1 over u, because u to the negative 1 is 1 over u. But since u is this, we end up with 1 over x squared plus 1 like that. Perfect. And for the second guy, notice our denominator is of the form x squared plus 1 squared. So we can actually write the integral of this as, so let me write ad. In fact, I'll just write it over here. It's going to be 1 over a, so 1 over 1, times tangent inverse of x over 1, which is just x. And then finally plus c, and we're done. Um, if you want to write this a little maybe better, is you can actually bring the negative 1 here like this and multiply 2 to the denominator. That looks a little better, but, you know, it's kind of the same thing. And in fact, if you want to write this minus that and reverse the order, that's fine too. Fantastic. So now there's one more problem I want to see. I know the video is getting kind of long, as chapter 7 videos tend to be.
but I want to see one more problem and then we'll be done with the video. All right, so this is an example of something I actually kind of mentioned. It's not actually a partial fractions case, but it's something to do where um, you have the instance where you have a quadratic denominator that can't be factored, but you can complete the square to write it as the form of something squared plus one and then split things up accordingly. So notice if we complete the square here, we can actually write x squared plus 2x plus 5 as x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus 4. Of course, because half of 2 squared is just 1, so that'll complete the square here, and we can write this as x plus 1 all squared plus 4. So I'm actually going to rewrite the denominator here. Again, the denominator can't be factored in this case. Otherwise, you can try partial fractions, but in this case, this is what you do. So I'm going to rewrite this, if that's okay, as x plus 1 squared, then plus 4. And now I want to use basically a u substitution so that this looks like u squared plus 4. So let's see if we can do that. We're going to let u equal x plus 1 and see what happens. So if u is equal to x plus 1, then notice du is just equal to dx, so there's no real change as far as multipliers go. But um, then what's of x plus 4? Well, notice if you actually add, um, not 4, but 3 to both sides, you get u plus 3 is equal to x plus 4. There's a few other ways to view that, but that I think is okay for us. So the numerator becomes u plus 3. The denominator clearly becomes u squared plus 4. Perfect. And this is indeed the scenario I spoke of previously, where you can split it up now because the denominators are the form we like for irreducible quadratics something squared plus a number. So if we split it up, we get u over u squared plus 4 du plus the integral of 3 over u squared plus 4 du. Notice here we can pull the 3 out, might as well. And notice this is just an inverse trig thing. So we'll do that in due time. This requires its own u sub, I guess a double u sub, <laughs> w. So let's uh, let w equal u squared plus 4, so that dw is equal to 2u du. And notice again, that's going to make 1 half dw equal to u du. We have u du, which is right here. We've seen this a bunch of times already. It's kind of the same thing, but it's fine. So now with the substitution, what do we get? We get 1 over w dw with a 1 half on the outside. So let me write 1 half integral of 1 over w dw, and this of course is 1 half times ln of absolute value of w, and then the plus c will write at the very end. And w is u squared plus 4, so this equals 1 half ln of u squared plus 4, good, plus, so now I'm going to handle this one by considering the fact that this 4 is 2 squared, and we're going to go and back we're going to go back and look at the, um, the fact we had for the inverse tangent of this, and basically, or for this being the inverse tangent of something, and basically it was 1 over a, which is 2, and since we have this 3, it's going to be 3 times 1 over a, so 3 times 1 over 2 is just 3 halves, times tangent inverse of what? Of x over a, so that's x over 2 in this case, and then plus c. Now, I kind of misspoke because I said x over a, but here it's u, actually. So it's u over 2. And that kind of begs the question, what happened to x? Our original integral was an x, so let's try to back substitute. Now, the really good news is that u plus 4, we actually know u plus 4 is equal to this. And just if you don't uh, recall, that original denominator was x squared plus 2x plus 5 before completing the square. So that means u squared plus 4 is equal to this, with the substitution in mind. So this really is 1 half ln of that expression, x squared plus 2x plus 5. Okay. And then plus 3 over 2, tangent inverse of u over 2. u is x plus 1, so that's x plus 1 all over 2. And then plus c. Wow. Fantastic, and that does it for 7.4, and I'll see you in the next video for 7.5, where we start to put all of Chapter 7 so far together. So I'll see you in the video for that. Thanks for watching.